Hi, everyone. So glad you're here. My name is Billy Somerville. I'm a clinical psychology PhD student here at the New School. I'm also a co-organizer of this event, along with Jessica. And we are very glad this is happening, partly because tomorrow we don't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> so um, this has been really, really exciting and a pleasure to put together. So <clears throat> just um, a few housekeeping things. In the middle of your program, there is a blank form that says questions for panelists. If during the first half of the program, while each of the panelists is presenting, if something kind of pops into your head that you think would be interesting for the moderated discussion part of the program, if you'll just write that down, then we'll collect them halfway through. And Jessica will use those to kind of fuel the conversation. Um, so <clears throat> this is going to be a great night. and. Um, I'm excited about it and want to get started as soon as possible. But just a few things before I turn it over to Jess. I wanted to just say that we, we, meaning she and I, who are clinical psychology students, are indebted to our program for making a space for this important conversation. And um, if there's anyone here who is not a new school student and would be interested in pursuing psychology graduate studies here, just feel free to come talk to Jess or me about it. We also have the director of clinical training here with us tonight. Her name is Miriam Steele. She'd be happy to speak to you about the program as well. So we want to thank the New School University Student Senate, the Lang Student Union, the Gender Studies Program, and the Psychology Student Union for generous financial support tonight. And there were a number of other people who supported us in non-material ways, including um, APA Division 35, the New School Social Justice Committee, and the Office of Social Justice Initiatives at the New School. Just really want to thank everyone in those groups <clears throat> for your energetic and enthusiastic support. This wouldn't have come together without your help. So tonight's <coughs> panel has a, a range of voices and perspectives on this issue. It's kind of rare that you get activists, political scientists, and psychologists together under one roof. Um, so let me introduce you to a soon-to-be psychologist, my classmate Jessica, and then she'll take it from there. So Jessica is a doctoral candidate in clinical psychology here at the New School for Social Research. Um, her research addresses the maternal body in relation to social constructions such as gender, power, culture, and oppression. She's a published author, a presenter at numerous conferences, a campus representative for APA Division 35, an outspoken feminist, and a great friend. Please welcome Jessica. <laughs> Thank you, Billy, for that kind welcome. Um, and I do want to thank everyone here. Let me move this in front of me. Um, I do want to thank everyone here. Um, it's lovely to see such an overwhelming and enthusiastic response to such a critical discussion point. Um, before we get started, I do want to quickly introduce Billy, um, since he's been a little bit behind the scenes today. Um, although Billy is heavily involved in his research here at the New School for Social Research, it, um, it's important to note that I've had the pleasure of witnessing his passionate commitment to social justice activism, as well as his integration within the academic setting. Um, this, this very much, this dedication to me is complemented by his excellent planning and um, compatibility in terms of us working together. And it, it's been the running joke that because this has been a, an overwhelming event to organize, but such a fulfilling one that if the whole PhD thing doesn't work out for us, we're just going to become event planners. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> a lot more money. In. <laughs> <laughs> Hire us for you your next event. Both. Yeah. <laughs> or both. <laughs> but, um, uh, but that's pretty much it. And um, thank you, Billy, for helping with this. And, and it going so well. So before we get started, if anyone has written any questions, you can start moving them to the outside. They'll eventually be collected. And at this point, I would like to introduce our guests. I'm going to keep introductions um, fairly brief today because there, um, there are detailed bios in the programs that you've received, and I think we would all love to hear from our panelists as opposed to me <laughs> talking. So um, our first panelist will be Dr. Lisa Rubin. Lisa is an assistant professor of psychology at the New School for Social Research, as well as the School for Public Engagement. Her work focuses on women's health, as well as how gender, power, privilege, and influ um, influence um, health experiences. Um, also, on a personal note, she is my, uh, my advisor, as well as my mentor, and has assisted Billy and I um, so much throughout this process. So please welcome Dr. Lisa Rubin.
Thank you, guys. So, um, I mean, they clearly are an amazing team and how they're recognizing each other, but I need to recognize Jess and Billy for everything that they've done today. Basically, um, I floated the idea by them and they made this event happen. Um, so, uh, you know, so for sure, even if you become clinical psychologists, <laughs> you will be hired <laughs> as event planners um, and uh, in the future. So, uh, really, I want to just introduce uh, the conversation here today. Um, if there was a subtitle for, uh, for the talk, it would be, in fact, there was a subtitle in our emails, um, our deep ambivalence um, about marriage. So as the larger public's ambivalence about marriage, fortunately, uh, about same-sex marriage in particular, fortunately seems to be uh, melting away, although I think still too slowly and a bit unevenly, lots of progress and um, points at which um, that uh, is, not, is not complete. Um, it, so that may, it may be an odd moment for this discussion, um, but it seems like, at least here, people um, might not think that way because there's been such interest um, uh, when we introduce the topic. So um, anyway, so I think as all of our panelists will each address, this historic moment really is a great opportunity to also reflect on the institution of marriage itself. So while folks on the far right worry very publicly um, about the state of marriage in the US, uh, I think progressive concerns receive a bit less airtime um, but are still deeply relevant. Um, so alongside the fight for marriage equality for same-sex marriage, um, many in the queer community ask themselves whether the right to marry uh, will become the obligation to marry. And, uh, and whether other ways of having relationships, forming families, will become delegitimized in the process. And, um, you know, and as we fight for this institution and access to this institution, you know, as a feminist, feminist scholar, to remind ourselves that um, this, you know, this is still this institution that we're struggling with, that as you know, recognizing as a key site for the reproduction of patriarchy. Um, and uh, you know, my impression is that um, we still have a way to go to see the majority of marriages um, looking like equal marriages. So my hope for this evening is that we can continue a conversation that um, my panelists, co-panelists here. Liz uh, and her partner Scout, who uh, I believe is here, as well as Melissa began um, when Scout, when Scout and Liz were engaged at the White House on Pride Day earlier this year, um, and then later uh, went on to discuss their their feelings, their complicated feelings about marriage on um, Melissa's show. So I met Liz. Before that, um, but shortly after I was married, um, when we were working on a writing project, and at the time we were discussing um, our uh, ambivalent feelings about marriage, um, as I was sort of thinking through the challenges of trying to organize a wedding, a marriage, a life, um, without falling into the sort of um, uh, traditional gender roles and expectations, both my partner and myself. Uh, as a, a side note, I kind of wish I could count or did count the number of people who, when I shared that I was engaged, asked the question, oh my god, let me, the first question was always, let me see the ring, um, <laughs> right? So we see the commodification of marriage. And then the next question was um, inevitably, and how did he propose? Um, so, you know, that, that even if we maybe think we're beyond that, that that's still, you know, the, the primary questions in discourse. Um, so, and both Liz and I being uh, psychotherapists also talked about the ways that we see that, at least within our field, within the mental health field, um, being unmarried, whether by choice or by chance, uh, is still, um, still generally viewed through a pathological lens in families um, other than the nuclear family, even if they represent the majority of, uh, of families in the United States, are still viewed through that pathological lens. So anyway, after Liz, um, uh, Liz was engaged and I read about it in the Huffington Post um, and wrote to congratulate her. Uh, she told me about being on the show and sent me the clip, um, but what she wrote in her email, um, and I saved it, uh, she said, <laughs> Lisa, you would love the Melissa Harris Perry show in that particular one because she, as always, was so smart about the ambivalence we all have or should have about marriage. So in that episode, um, Melissa summarized the complicated issue of marriage equality so well in her footnote at the end of the show that I'm going to quote a bit of it here, um, So, because I can never say it as well as she said it. Um, so. Um, so our work is not just about marriage equality. It should be about equal marriages, about equal rights and securities for those who opt out of marriage altogether. I hope that marriage equality results in more equal marriages and more opportunities for building meaningful adult lives outside of marriage. So following that, um, our plan for this evening is to shift the typical discussion about marriage equality to one of marriage and equality, and hence the uh, little uh, uh, 
imagery on our uh, program, uh, and, uh, and to try to envision a marriage equality movement um, that's rooted in, uh, essentially, a marriage equality movement with a social justice mission. So all of our panelists have been engaged with issues of marriage and equality in unique ways through their work as activists and academics, as well as in their um, personal lives as private and public citizens navigating their own personal relationships. So each will share a bit from their work, from their life, whether personal or professional, followed by what we hope will be a rich discussion with you guys about the topic. So move, moving <laughs> along to the personal. <laughs> um, and I'm going to speak into the mic because I've been instructed. I'm not doing that really well. OK. So our next panelist is uh, Liz Margulies. Liz is a practicing psychotherapist, founder of the National LGBT Cancer Network, and recent guest on MSNBC's Melissa Harris Perry. Through her work, Liz has helped to eradicate LGBT cancer health disparities. Please join me in welcoming Liz Margulies. Thanks. How's the mic? Is it good? Thank you. I only care that you, for posterity here. <laughs> so, hi. Um, hi. Um, I have a small wardrobe of professional hats, but I think the best one for me to wear on this panel is my personal one. I want to talk about my own life history as a way to represent the complicated, twisted, raw, internal, irrational side of the debate. Please try to remember that I am actually a smart person because I want to talk about some things that stand in opposition to my intelligence and are sometimes in conflict with it. I, in front of my distinguished colleagues um, and all of you, it isn't easy, but I think it's important because every decision we make is based on both our psychology and our politics. And perhaps my personal story will have some resonance for at least one other person here in the room. Um, my parents were divorced when I was 14 years old. And as a result, I both long for and distrust longevity, let alone permanence in relationships. And I feel like I could throw my papers up in the air and end my talk here because essentially, you now know everything you need to know about me. <laughs> However, um, I have covered this conflict with the fiercest independence and a queer life that has celebrated all the lovers I have amassed over 40 years of falling in love and then breaking up. But let me go back again to 1967 when my parents uh, divorced and I yearned to have my first boyfriend. My parents weren't hippies, I assure you. But the values they married under in 1950 had given way to a new entitlement to self-fulfillment and the duties of marriage were not compatible with the freedom for personal exploration. My father had an affair with his 26-year-old secretary, duh, and my parents divorced. My mother then struggled financially, and I was no longer able to keep up with the purchase of the necessary fashionable goods that defined being cool. And for this, I was deeply resentful, and I focused all of my resentment on my mother, not my father. He visited regularly, gave us gifts, and took us out to lovely dinners. My association with a divorced woman also stained me socially. Back then, a divorced woman was feared by her friends because she had been sexually awakened through marriage and now was hungry for more. She could steal their husbands. My mother couldn't get a credit card in her name, and because she had stopped work when she got married at my father's insistence, she had a terrible time finding a job. It was a point of pride for my father to be able to support a wife and then his kids. But 17 years later, divorced with three children, she was short on money and had no professional skills. I did not identify with my mother. I hated her. And I vowed to be different, like most adolescent daughters do. I hated her loss, her weakness, and her demeaned social status. Her life, let's face it, was a poor sales pitch for marriage. I went to college in 1971 and dove headfirst into radical feminism. Yes, consciousness raising groups, we started the country's second rape crisis center. In feminism, I found an ethos, principles that match my history, my fears, and my rugged independence. Feminism fit me. Marriage, please, a repressive institution for women. I was completely smitten with my best friend Cindy Katz, and we decided we would form a quaternary marriage a combined marriage of two heterosexual couples, um, the two of us, of course, and our boyfriends. She was in a long-term relationship, and at this point, I was kind of going through a lot of guys. Um, <laughs> we read about it somewhere, and it seemed perfect. 
divide your dependents among three other people and have your best friend in the house with you. <laughs> I came out as a lesbian in my first semester of graduate school. The time between having my first inkling that I might be attracted to women and kissing my then best friend was about 24 hours. <laughs> it was 1975, what can I say? <laughs> that relationship only lasted about a month, but I loved my newfound identity as a social outlaw. I loved the secret community I was now a member of. And let me stress something that I haven't said clearly before. I never hated men. I hated my mother's marriage <coughs> to one. I identified with my father and his apparent freedom. And once my own freedom was firmly established by moving out and forming deep roots in my own radical social world, I forgave my mother completely and we actually became very close. She had also recovered from the divorce by then and I came out to her within two weeks of that first kiss. I transformed the trauma of being different into a celebration, a private party with my peers. I never dreamed of some new gay normalcy. The price of assimilation would be the loss of my outlaw status and the rabble-rousing power that that gave me. And in terms of my politics, marriage was not something this lesbian would ever fight for. I was after civil rights. I marched in the Gay Pride March every year, minus about three, since 1976. And I have viewed the marriage equality movement as a drain on our community's resources, a conservative push to marriage straight people, to mimic straight people, exactly the thing I wanted to get away from. Remember my mother? And then in 1992, I had a child using anonymous sperm donor number 64, <coughs> relabeling me a single lesbian parent. I was pregnant that, at the same time that Murphy Brown, the television character, was. And the, pres the vice president at the time, Dan Quayle, condemned her and by association me for, uh, let me get the quote right, mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's detour back to my professional life. Around this time, I became trained as a divorce mediator, although I rarely used these skills to help heterosexual, legally married couples divorce. Instead, I helped couples whose relationships took place outside the law separate <coughs> outside the law. Together, we create individualized and highly personal terms for the equitable distribution of their goods, money, pets, children, etc. My ultimate conclusion, my clinical opinion, Breaking up sucks any way you slice it. And then four years ago, admittedly a bit scarred and jaded from all the love lost and found along the way, I met Scout, a transgender man, and more than that, a, a person who spans centuries, a transgenerational person. He's really only a visitor to this century. <laughs> To know him is to know it's that. Really true. <laughs> we met at an LGBT health conference in DC and I dismissed him immediately as a player, despite finding him brilliant and charming. Besides, he was way too young for me. But he wooed me in an old fashioned way after the conference with letters. Yes, the letters were typed on a computer, and yes, they arrived in my email account, <laughs> but they were letters. <laughs> and like Cyrano de Bergerac, I fell in love with the articulate and diffident 19th century man who wrote me those letters. A few other facts about the odd pairing of Scout and me. He lives in a small town in Rhode Island and is the father of three children who live with him two weeks out of every four. I am a dyed-in-the-wool New Yorker and still a single parent of an extremely complicated, now 20-year-old. My son has a crisis of some magnitude at least once per month. <laughs> Scout and I don't live together, and it isn't even possible to consider it until his youngest child goes to college, should he be so lucky, in another five years. The truth is, I kind of like it this way. I guess I confessed to him some night in the dark that I longed for forever, that I wished a thing like marriage could work, that a promise could keep the love and deep intimacy we had going forever. I wanted to never have to delete the photos like you know you have to do when you break up. I wanted to be, always be able to turn to him and say, what was the name of that place in Puerto Rico? I wanted to believe in forever, and I envied those who did, but I still didn't. Scout held on to my secret, uh, my secret wish for forever, and believe me, I told him it was a secret. Despite how much I ranted to the contrary by daylight, and despite how often I broke up with him for some perceived crime or other. 
Publicly, I still say and believe that, marriage is, that while marriage has changed legally from the one my mother entered and left, it is still a repressive institution. I do not want to ask a fucking judge for permission to leave a relationship. That should be my decision. And then this past June, uh, Scout and I were invited to the White House for their annual LGBT Pride event. It was amazing to be there, actually more than I would have predicted. We traveled down separately, of course, and Scout missed his plane. Um, but I was thrilled to be there, even alone. <laughs> I met Melissa there. And yes, finally, Scout showed up, and we celebrated with other activists and friends who were there in attendance. And at some point late in the event, Scout called my name. I turned around to look at him, and he fell down on one knee. Perhaps you've seen the video. I put my hand spontaneously over my mouth and backed away. <laughs> I didn't hear a word he said as the Marine Band was playing loudly, but I know the universal sign for dropping down to one knee. My first thought after, <clears throat> oh shit, was, was to look around and see, is anybody else watching? <laughs> yes, about 100 people stopped to stare. What was I going to do? I don't want to be married. I want to be an outlaw. I don't want the legal system in my bedroom or even my kitchen. Is anybody still watching? Yes, the crowd of people is going, look at him down on his knee like an old-fashioned gentleman. I love him. It would be great if I could love him forever or what's left of my forever. But what if he's an asshole to me? And then I'll have to stay with him. Time was passing and I felt how humiliating this must be for that crazy time traveler still on his knee. I took a deep breath and I made the first promise to myself, take the plunge, Liz, and just give it your best. And then I made the promise to him. I said a loud yes and I fell down on my knee to meet him. I understood that this was simultaneously a very private and a very public event. I had no idea it would set off such a political firestorm on the right and such a romantic firestorm in our community. I thought erroneously this was just between me and Scout. So the love and especially the hatred we received was really shocking to me. Now I'm engaged and everybody knows it. I was ambushed. I couldn't say no. Some people who watched the video were struck by this, as were some of my friends, and they were angry at Scout on my behalf. It took me weeks, oh, let's face it, months, to realize that Scout did ambush me, <coughs> but not to control me, not because he is unconflicted about marriage, but because he was willing to play the fool, to give me what he understood I wanted and I was afraid to acknowledge. My dream, that everlasting love, had come true for me. I've tried to tell myself that if we successfully made this unusual kind of relationship, we could make our own kind of marriage. But after much thought, I actually want to say I don't think that's true. If I say a simple sentence to you, a stranger, like, my husband thinks he left his glasses here, or I check, I have an intake form and I check married, I cannot stop you from having the following assumptions. He is a cisgender man meaning he was assigned male at birth. I am heterosexual, gag. We live together. <laughs> we share our finances, or at least a joint checking account. We are monogamous. We are step-parents to each other's children. We're on the same health insurance plan. We spent Thanksgiving together. Actually, only one of those is true. We are currently monogamous. So what, you say? Who cares what they think? I care. Be the change you want to see in the world. I want to see all relationships be honored. I don't want the false new respect this one now gets. Like over my friendship with Jackie, for example, one of my best friends for over 30 years. No sex, no romance, but she is more my daily domestic partner. I, I'm the one who helps her clean out her closet. I help her pack for every trip. She has not bought a new pair of eyeglass frames without my approval, and we only go to Costco together. <laughs> Working for NYU, she also has health insurance that would be more valuable to share than Scouts, which only recognizes providers in New England. But no honor is given to my relationship with Jackie. Many progressive leaders claim that abiding love cannot be a sin. My love for Scout is powerful, but I don't know that it'll be abiding. I can only hope so. But similarly, all my previous loves, while finite in length, were not sins either. Time cannot be the measure of goodness. And yes, 
despite all I've said here, or given all I've said here, I took the next step myself. Together with Scout on an Amtrak train to Washington, D.C. about six weeks ago, I suggested to Scout that we elope. And yesterday morning, in the study of Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum of the LGBT synagogue here in New York City, we got married. This time, it was both personal and consciously political, but very private. I did not want a wedding where I asked all of my ambivalent friends, come celebrate my relationship. <laughs> that seemed crazy and disrespectful. We told our children in advance about the plan, but we chose our, our <coughs> witnesses to represent the complicated promise that marriage can be, that we should all work to make it be. We tipped our hats to the past in many ways, in terms of the Jewish tradition and our outfits, and, and to the future. Melissa was there as one of our witnesses, and our friend James Clementi, the brother of Tyler Clementi, who, the gay Rutgers student who took his life a little over a year ago. And we also had two other trans youth there as our witnesses. People, we hoped, who could use our story to bolster their own romantic fantasies for their futures. We want them to want to have a future. Let the record show, I'm as tortured about all of this today as I was last week. Only now, I'm married. <laughs> Me, married to Scout. I am terrified, thrilled, and embarrassed. And I think that's the exact right combination. Mm -hmm. I will never call him my husband. But let the record also show I am madly in love with Scout, and I do hope to stay with him forever. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Our next panelist is Dr. Melissa Harris-Perry. Melissa is the host of MSNBC's current events and opinion show, Melissa Harris-Perry, and a professor of political science at Tulane University. She is an accomplished academic, writer, and media icon. Please help me welcome her to our <laughs> So I, I did cry at uh, Liz and Scout's wedding. Um, yesterday, and um, you can call it a study, but it was in a vault, and um, I'm pretty sure it was in a vault with the door closed so that you could not run, um, and, uh, and it, was, it was really extraordinary, and um, you know, when I, when I met Liz, I knew sort of instantaneously that we were um, in many ways the same person in, in different bodies, um, and, and maybe from slightly different moments, but um, because of that, what I'll do is maybe to reemphasize that, I will tell a little bit of um, of my personal story in ways that, that hopefully will um, reflect, and then I'll try to um, end it just a bit on some of the work um, that I'm up to both um, in the academy and uh, through the show. So queer family is um, also at the core of what I um, experience as part of my self-identity. Um, so for me, queer family was not about same-sex loving family, it was about queerness in other ways. My mother, who grew up in a um, Mormon household in Spokane, Washington, is a white woman who graduated from um, Brigham Young University in 1964. She um, is from Mormon pioneers who pushed hand carts across the American West during the ejection of um, Mormons. And my great-great-grandfather um, was uh, imprisoned in this country for polygamy. Um, because he was living in the Utah territories and married um, in a plural marriage to more than one wife. And then Utah became a state, and when it became a state, his marriage became illegal. Um, but because of the nature of both his faith claims and his community, um, he did not believe it was appropriate to divorce um, a wife, and so he uh, was imprisoned instead. My father, at the same time that my mother was um, a uh, white woman going to Brigham Young University in the early 1960s, my dad was college roommates with Stokely Carmichael at Howard University, <laughs> and um, is a um, sort of uh, black civil rights um, activist who became the first dean of African American Affairs at the University of Virginia. But my dad also grew up in a queer family. In that, um, my father's um, father, um, William Wells, was married to a woman who couldn't bear children. Um, and so he <coughs> took 
basically a second wife, although they were not legally married, who's my grandmother, Rosa Harris. So I'm not really a Harris, I'm a Wells, because I'm a Harris only maternally, but you can't have the maternal name, because why would you have your mother's name? You should have your father's name. Anyway, so, um, so Rosa Harris um, was, a, uh, was a widow and had with my, um, with my grandfather, William Wells, the twins, my father and his twin brother, um, and lived together, not in the same household, but certainly with everyone knowing what all of these families were. So when my father, who was from this sort of um, uh, informal polygamous family, met my mother, um, who was from her own sort of much more formal, although intergenerational polygamous family in the 1970s in graduate school for sociology, the University of Washington. My dad was married to an African-American woman and had three children, and nonetheless, my mom, a white woman, who had been married previously and had a white daughter, um, basically as a second wife. So I come from a family where um, my African-American father was married during all of my childhood to a black woman who is also my godmother who I dearly love and has three African-American children. And then my mother who um, was uh, divorced from her white husband and, ha and I have a sister therefore who is almost six feet tall and has enormous blonde hair and gigantic blue eyes. Um, and then there's me. And we lived in Virginia in the 1970s. <laughs> the work that I hope to be up to, um, academically, intellectually, politically, um, through the public aspects that are the show, as well as through the much less public aspects of academic writing, um, is, a, is an attempt to consistently manage what I see as the fundamental angst within American public life between liberty and equality. I mean, it's, it, it really is just sort of that, that constant um, angst and question about how we think about governing ourselves and what we think of as being in our collective good and yet our great desire for freedom and autonomy. Many nations have already worked this out in ways that um, lean far towards equality or far towards liberty. I think it is for us our great angst. So for example, I think states' rights arguments are all fundamentally flawed at their core because they're about slavery, mm -hmm. and yet I'm going to make a states' rights argument tomorrow on the show about Washington State and marijuana, right? And I'm going to say the DEA should not be enforcing um, uh, problematic drug laws, given that the states of California and, um, and Washington have passed state laws. Now, obviously, that is in direct contrast to my understanding of what the federal government and Justice Department ought to be doing around civil rights law, for example, in the state of Louisiana. And so, f for me, it is constantly managing those questions of how we think about our ideological positions versus our fundamental commitments to these I sort of American ideals of liberty and equality, and for me, than the embodied human experience. Because in the end, I did remarry. My decision to remarry was ultimately a choice that was available to me because I am cis and heterosexual and because the laws of this land give me the right to at any point work out my ambivalence, change it, enter into, exit out of, and as painful as it is to ask a judge to be divorced and sometimes you have to ask and ask and ask and ask, Yes. Um, the the very fact that I that I have the power to move in and out of those spaces is about my privilege as as a cis heterosexual woman, and as much as I experience the kind of Michael Warner, the trouble with normal, and the ways in which the normalizing of marriage as a political goal. Um, silences the very value that queer politics brings to queering all families, including so-called straight families, although my family was many things but not straight. Um, the whole point is that once, when some families are operating with a kind of privilege and others aren't, that you, ha you have to fight first there, even to the extent that we have these ambivalences and sense that of how limited marriage is. And then I'll leave with the, the very, my very final statement here is, for me, consistently when I'm trying to figure out these questions, I tend to go back to slavery. Um, because I find the decision making of slaves and enslaved people to be very useful because the time horizon for enslaved people, um, and I mean specifically intergenerational chattel slavery in the US South, right? So I don't necessarily mean contemporary <coughs> slavery as it continues to exist in, in forms throughout the world, but US South um, intergenerational chattel slavery. And the reason I find 
that a, an important place to think about decision making is because when the contingency of your life is not only just about yours but also intergenerational, when you expect that your children will also be in the same condition of servitude in, and, and the, the people from whom you came were in this condition of servitude, um, that time horizon makes, for me, decision-making fascinating. And so I've read a lot about the kinds of choices that slaves made around marriage. And some of what they did was to create queered plural marriages of all different kinds that um, produced all sorts of different forms of family. Some of what they did was pretty horrifying. There's this amazing story of a woman, a free woman who's married to an enslaved man. She's free and black. He's enslaved and black. They're living in Virginia. He is abusive to her. Um, she knows that the state of Virginia, the law is um, once you are freed, if you're enslaved, once you're freed, you have to leave the state within 24 hours. This, you know, Virginia didn't want a bunch of newly freed Negroes around causing revolution, right? Um, so she works and works and works for about seven years and buys her husband's freedom. And she buys her husband's freedom so that he will be forced to leave the state. So she buys his freedom and before he leaves the state, he burns her house down. Wow. Right? There's, there, I mean, there's almost no response, but oh, oh yeah. So, and then there are the stories of men and women who actually entered back into slavery after having been freed in order to be married. People who actually made the choice to be in slavery in order to be in um, monogamous, what they understood as recognized by the God that they were worshiping marriages. And so that tells me that marriage is a thing that is not just about the state, and it's not just about the judge. It's, it, it is this other thing that human beings are, are engaged in, in processes that are so enormous that, it, it, we can't, that the limitation of it becomes not just a question of our legal boundaries, but a fundamental question of our, of our morality, of who we are as human beings in relationship to one another, that we would restrict the ability of human beings to engage in relationships that, that folks in the context of intergenerational human um, chattel bondage slavery made. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Our next panelist is Dr. Diva Woodley. Diva is an assistant professor of politics at the New School for Social Research. Both an activist and academic, her work examines civil and political discourse from perspectives of citizens, political advocates, and social movements. Please help me welcome Diva Woodley. OK, so you'll have to bear with me as you can hear um, my voice is a little bit limited. Um, so the end of what Melissa was talking about is exactly sort of where I want to enter um, into this conversation about ambivalence with marriage. Um, and you'll have to sort of bear with me because I was supposed to bring my tablet, but I forgot it. Um, so I'm like sort of going back and forth between my phone and my written notes. Um, but here's the thing. I am a good lefty, right? I'm a progressive. Um, I want to be against marriage, uh, but I'm not. Uh, I am a feminist, I'm critical of neoliberal capitalism, and, um, and I'm active in thinking, writing, and, um, and I'm sorry, I'm active in thinking, writing, and, and doing regarding revealing and beating back multiple forms of discrimination, mar marginalization, and oppression. Uh, I'm an ideal audience for the queer, queer critique of marriage, uh, but there's something about the institution or something about the promise uh, that holds me back from being unequivocally critical uh, of marriage, of being against marriage. Um, I ought to be persuaded by the articulate and passionate cases against these institutions made by my friends, colleagues, activists that I've worked with for years, um, people that I admire, which urge progressives to abandon this cause and refocus efforts toward more liberatory movement. But I'm not. I have wrestled with myself as to why that is the case. Is it simply a hopelessly hegemonic disposition, or if you like, uh, internalized oppression, which the constant and often involuntary, but also sometimes voluntary, I, I like a good romantic comedy, <laughs> right? Consumption of heteronormativity and romance 
um, you know, talk of love and happily ever after, after engenders, and I say that with the full understanding of the meaning of that term, or is it something else? What could that something else be? I'm gonna to return to that question. What I know, right, what my intellect says, the arguments that I hear that really resonate with me is that empirical data, right, what we know about people's outcomes uh, shows us that formal equality, that is rights before the law for redress of discrimination in one dimension often mask and reproduce systematic inequality in a whole array of other dimensions. This is not only the case in terms of outcomes, but also within movements themselves. Women of color have told this story for hundreds of years in scholarship and poetry and song, and often all three at once. So I just want to begin, and Melissa, I hope you're sympathetic, um, with quoting the bridge poem, right? Many of you, I'm sure, will be uh, familiar with this, um, written by, um, uh, Donna Kate Ruskin uh, in 1980 about this, this intersection and what it means, the bridge poem. I've had enough. I'm sick of seeing and touching both sides of things, sick of being the damn bridge for everybody. Nobody can talk to anybody without me, right? I explain my mother to my father, my father to my little sister, my little sister to my brother, my brother to the white feminists, the white feminists to the black church folks, the black church folks to the ex-hippies, the ex-hippies to the black uh, separatists, the black separatists to the artist, and the artist to my friend's parents. Then I've got to explain myself. And I'm tired, right? So being at this, intersection is nothing new, right? Being ambivalent, uh, trying to figure out what justice means, right? What doing justice means um, in circumstances that are non-ideal and where there are no easy answers or quick loyalties is not new, right? For women of color, it's not new uh, for me personally. Um, and I think that women of color, of course, are not the only ones. Right? All people who are at the intersection of marginalization and oppression in different ways find themselves being bridges, right? trying to see different sides of things, not easily able to choose whose side they're on. So here are the things that I know about the queer critique of marriage equality. Right? First, one of, I think, the most trenchant critiques is that the marriage movement is bourgeois. Right? It has no economic argument, uh, an argument about economic inequality, and in no way theorizes from margin to center, right, as bell hooks would have us do. Marriage absolutely does, of course, has economic implications, not only historically, but today. I think that the most sort of uh, persuasive version of this argument has been penned by Lisa Duggan in her book, The Twilight of Equality, right? We know that people's, or progressives, might think that people's health and well-being should not be irrevocably and institutionally tied to the formalization of their romantic relationships. And in fact, that is, you know, the way um, that it is in this place and time, and it's becoming more so. Does the marriage movement add to that kind of um, um, institutional reification or structural um, condition, right, that oppresses so many, right? So if you're responsible, the state thinks, the neoliberal state, right? I always put neo in, in parentheses because I'm not exactly sure um, what the difference between neoliberal and liberal is. Um, but the neoliberal state wants to foist, right, according to Lisa Duggan, ever more of its social responsibility onto individuals using, right, covering with a moral logic. That is, if you were responsible and virtuous, you would be in a life-sustaining, sometimes literally, relationship with another capable person. Of course we know that the causal arrow most likely, right, and most often is reversed. People who tend to marry are ones who are already more stable economically and have better prospects in terms of their life chances. Right? The second critique that I find very persuasive in terms of a queer critique of marriage is that we also know, right, it's a feminist critique, that women um, are often victimized in their in intimate relations, right? Women and men as well. Some people have really um, unfortunate, terrible families, right? Or really unfortunate, terrible relationships. Uh, and I mean biological families. 
um, and their life chances should not be dictated by whether they happen to be in a bad or good relation or in bad or good relation with the folks that the state designates as their kin. Um, you know, one of the most sort of um, indicative moments of this was recently, um, not too recently, we can think about the NFL player and what happened with that. Um, but previous to that, when I first moved to New York, Mayor Bloomberg was trying to um, make it a rule that in order to receive shelter, homeless people would have to prove that they had no next of kin, right? Okay, so this is deeply, deeply problematic, right? And affects real people's lives, right? In this view, people have value as individual members um, of the polity in the, in the queer critique, right? People have value as individual members in the polity and they should be supported by the state apparatus in appropriate and needed ways, period. <coughs> My friend Yasmin Nair, who Kenyon also knows, always makes this point, right? This is often paired with a class-based argument, right? very much like the economic critique um, that I talked about before, that poor people are more likely to be socially disconnected or to be connected to other poor people who are similarly disadvantaged and social support um, and have less social support um, uh, that is tied in with their kinship. So the third critique, right, the third queer critique of marriage that I find very resonant is that there, uh, it is the case, right, that marriage marginalizes those, right? Marriage equality, the marriage equality movement can marginalize those who cannot conform, right? Who cannot or will not conform, who can't pass, right? Both for economic reasons, um, uh, you know, sometimes there's a partner drought. Um, it's very similar to, for instance, black women, right? Um, who are heterosexual um, uh, or for reasons of self-expression, right? That they're not square, right? That they, you know, are not going to be very much like this, right? Um, sucked into this institution, um, and because they're outlaws, because they're radical queers, right? And even though each of these critiques resonates with me intellectually, there's still something, right? There's still something that I think marriage is doing, and that thing is not only emotional and personal, although it is also that. I think we also have to think about the social organization right, of institutions. That is, the way that marriage um, impacts our relationship with social structures, okay? So I'm gonna get a little bit academic on you for a minute and talk about Pierre Bourdieu, okay? Um, and also Ann Swidler. So Pierre Bourdieu emphasizes that um, culture is not a set of rules, but is a deeply internalized habits, styles, and skills, the habitus, right, that allow human beings to continually produce innovative actions that are nonetheless meaningful to others around them. For Boudou, active human beings actively recreate culture. They do not dutifully follow cultural rules, but they energetically seek strategic advantage by using culturally encoded skills. Okay, this is because, and, and it turns out, that access to these skills is differently distributed um, because people's strategic efforts reproduce the structure of inequality, right? That means that inequalities between the more and less privileged penetrate persons so deeply that they constitute the fundamental capacities for judgment, aesthetic response, social ease, or political confidence with which they act in the world, right? There's an enormous volume uh, by Verba, uh, uh, Schlossman, Verba, and Brady that gives like endless statistics about the ways that social status, particularly social class, um, uh, organize political participation, right? Um, so we know that this has an amazing effect. Actors use culture, right, in creative ways to forward their own interests, but their position in culture is something um, that is a part of how they grow up, right, what they think their place in the world is. The toolkit that they have, that they use, right, comes from that place. So the effect um, of that struggle, right, of all kinds of struggles, particularly for equality, right, for equality rather than transformation, for instance, tend to reproduce basic structures uh, of inequality on different dimensions. So this is 
the critique of marriage that I feel I should accept wholly, right? That this should make me uh, against marriage, right? To be, to have one phrase. Because it does reproduce unequal systems um, with reforms rather than tr transforming those systems in, into more just ones. And I think this is absolutely true. But I don't think that that truth is enough. So for example, affirmative action is the same way. Um, the chief beneficiaries of, of, of action tend to be bourgeois, right? They have been, they are bourgeois. But I don't also think that affirmative action should be ended, OK? Though I agree that the, this ki these kinds of um, anti-discrimination measures, right, in terms of marriage equality, in terms of affirmative action, ought not be let off the hook for the fact that they do reproduce um, systems of inequality. Um, I also think uh, that the truth is equality, though it's not enough, is not nothing. So a moment from Anne Swidler. She writes, she's a sociologist who talks about culture and love. She writes, I think very perceptively, even when the cultural organization of action is not working, people do not readily take advantage of new structural opportunities which would require them to establish new ways of life. This is not because they're clinging to cultural values, but because they are reluctant to abandon familiar strategies for organizing their lives and the life world um, uh, without knowing whether they have the cultural equipment uh, to do that, right? to exist in a new environment, in a new structure, in a different relation to institutions. Because cultural expertise underlies the ability of both individuals and groups to construct effective strategies of action in the world, in the world that we live in, right? In the world that we have to experience every day, such matters as the style or ethos of action and the related ways of organizing authority and cooperation are enduring aspects of individual and especially collective life. That was called Anne Swidler. More, and she goes on to write, the fact that as descriptions of the world or even of our own experience, such cultural meanings, like the meaning of marriage, right, like that romantic comedy promise, may be contradictory or incomplete, does nothing to undermine their, their plausibility in our lived experience. <coughs> as long as cultural meanings help people mobilize the internal and external supports they need for action, then those things are culturally, they remain culturally relevant and true, right? in a certain sense. So my questions of the queer critique of gay marriage, right, and of marriage more generally, are of two kinds. One is a democratic persuasive sort of set of questions. Because, you know, my friends are get really annoyed with me about this, because critique is not enough, OK? So if, if we're really interested in transforming institutions, right, in, in transforming cultural practices into things that will be more just, right, in transforming the world into a more just world where we can have social relations that we might desire, then we have to persuade somebody, right? So the loss of being a, the loss, and I, I take that seriously, right, of being a cultural outlaw, right? The empowerment that um, one derives from being on the outside and making it anyway, right? Is a real loss, right, for many people. But um, that can't be the whole picture, right? Revolution actually doesn't happen only in a closed circle of cultural outlaws, right? We have to persuade somebody. So my first kinds of questions are, so, how do you persuade people right, to be open to the kinds of transformations to social structures that would be necessary in order to make our relations, romantic and other kinds of kinship relations, more just? You know? How do you convince the people who don't know what you're talking about right, when you say that you're against marriage, when you say that marriage is an inherently dominative and impressive institution? Right? I go home to my parents, right? And they're like, <laughs> you so, you've been in school so long. <laughs> right? So, um, you know, so there is a set of people that could be convinced, right? If they could understand the vision, right? If they could understand the vision um, that, would, that might be forwarded 
uh, in the sort of spirit or taking into account the queer critique of marriage. But often, there is no such vision available, right? That is, we tell people, no, don't do that. But we don't tell them what kinds of cultural equipment will be necessary for doing something different, right? We don't tell them what the new world, what the new way of organizing our lives and our social interactions will look like. We just say, no, don't do that, <laughs> right? There is no, this is how we could live, right? Or there is an amorphous, this is how we could live. We could all live in our own way, right? But we live in society with culture, right? So the truth is, that there have to be some kinds of common understandings about what social relations look like. So if we continue to live this way, uh, you know, sort of in marriage, like I am married, right? I, uh, and I call my husband my husband, right? Um, if we continue to live this way, uh, what we understand, right, from queer critiques is that we are in some way villainous, destructive, hypocritical, that we've given up, uh, that we've sold out, well, that may be true, but my question is, what is being offered instead, right? So, hold on, you guys, sorry. Um, sorry, I really did lose my place. Okay, because we live with these contradictions all the time, these kinds of contradictions, right? Not just whether to marry or not, whether to be in monogamous relations or not, whether our marriage will be monogamous or not, right? We live with these fundamental contradictions, at least progressives do, particularly people who are lefties, all the time. Those of us who challenge and critique dominant social institutions, um, economic arrangements, are always acting always acting because our activity is structured by the actually existing social world, right, in ways that are contradictory to our ideals. We may think outside the box, but the truth is that we live inside it, right? So I have a scathing critique of neoliberal capitalism, but I still like to shop. <laughs> I have a feminist critique of, and I love your project, right, the maternal body um, and the assumption of woman as mother, but I yearned my entire life to be a parent, and particularly a mother, and would have been terribly devastated. It would have been a serious, I am also, but it would have been a serious problem for me if, by circumstance, um, I hadn't been able to become a parent, right? So these are, I think, the social realities that we struggle with. The difference between our ideals, right, uh, and the social activity in the world. So, um, I recognize, I have to say, in this, my relative privilege. Um, I'm more or less straight, middle class, educated, and now married. I agree with Bell Hooks's notion that our politics should begin from the margins, right, and on the periphery. Uh, and in that way, there are, there are ways in which I feel like I have the responsibility to negate or reject my relative privilege, right? And yet, and yet, our current, our current social relations still organize my action and the action of many others, right? The action of most of us. And all of our action um, to a greater or lesser degree. Perhaps the most obvious sort of answer to this conundrum for me is that I am not creative enough to maneuver outside these structural relations, or I'm not courageous enough to sacrifice my relative social ease in solidarity for those who are the most vulnerable and oppressed. And these things might be, I think, true, but like neoliberal meritocratic arguments that deny the importance of social structures and contents, context in favor of facile discourses focused on exceptions and heroes, the truth is I live inside the box, right? Even though I strive to think outside of it. Most people are not gonna choose to fall on their swords when it comes down to it. We must give the majority, right, most people, people who are not gonna be heroes, people who uh, are not going to um, live their entire lives as radical outsiders, we must give them options if we really want to 
transform the social institutions that structure our lives. <clears throat> so this brings me to the second kind of question that I have of queer critiques of marriage. And that is, what are, what are we gonna do, right? What is the work that queers want to do? Is it about making a space for those outside the bounds of normative society or breaking down heteronormativity? Sometimes it feels like banishing the category, banishing normativity altogether, right? But you can't banish normativity, right? Uh, and I don't mean that in a sort of like we have to embrace this kind of way. I mean it as a social fact. Because the case is that not everyone can be a radical outsider, not just constitutively, but also in reality. There are going to be norms and normativity. It is not that norms, those norms, whatever they are, will be essentially correct. They never are. It's that they're necessary for both ourselves understanding and our social understandings, let alone our interactions. If we know that to be true, right, then the question becomes, what kind of normativity should heteronormativity be replaced with? What institutions, meanings, practices, and policies would support the kind of world we'd like to live in? So, so I have more, but I think I'm sort of going on too long. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, given that there are gonna be social categories that we have to operate in, right? That I, I am going to care, right? How you're related to, um, you know, if you're my friend, right? Um, I'm gonna care how your romantic relation is defined, right? Not in terms of who it is or whether it's, um, you know, straight or gay or, or how they're identified in terms of cisgender, but I wanna know how they're related to you. I wanna know if their relationship is, if, if their relation to you is intended to be durable or not, right? I wanna know who I have to invite to my dinner party, right? Um, likewise, um, the state, I think, has a legitimate interest, right, a justifiable interest anyway, in knowing who is kin to whom, though no right to prescribe who should be so designated, right? We can pretend that we should all just be cool with no assumptions and endless <coughs> variations, but that's not really how things work. Everything from language to social activity to law is organized based on some set of assumptions about the way things and people are related, as well as default judgments and categories about the meaning and significance of those relations. So, uh, Diva, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna, I wanna, we all wanna keep hearing, but we do wanna get a couple questions in, so maybe we can wrap in a couple minutes, is that all right? I'm wrapping right now. Awesome, sorry, uh, okay. thank you. So, um, yeah, so that's what I want to end with. I want to end with the fact that um, people who are critiquing marriage, all of us who are ambivalent about marriage, are in a kind of space of intersectional, um, an intersectional space. And I want to call our attention back to that bridge poem and call attention back to, I think, the experience um, that, you know, the, the idea um, that black women have talked about for so many years, which is to say, how do you find out how to do justice? How do you figure out how to do justice in situations that are complex and unclear, right? Because it's about more than pointing out what's wrong, right? Although that's necessary and this conversation is necessary. It's also about defining what's right, right? What might be right for us? What kinds of society we would like to live in? What kinds of organization of social relations? we could actually live under and with and through. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diva. Our next panelist is Kenyon Farrow. Kenyon is the current communications director for the Praxis Project. Through his activism and avid publications, Mr. Farrow has been a leading voice on LGBT, HIV and AIDS, and racial justice issues. Please help me welcoming Kenyon. Um, thank you um, for the for the invitation. I'm actually really happy to be here. Um, I, I'm gonna um, first kind of respond to a couple things and then sort of give some prepared remarks. So first, I, I want to sort of um, say the kind of and I've I've written quite a bit about 
marriage and marriage equality and the racial <laughs> politics of, of same-sex marriage debate and, you know, some of that I'll get into and some of that, I, you know, it's out there. Um, but I'll, I'll say kind of my, my sort of political orientation around the sort of questions that I'm interested in is less about marriage as a personal choice, right? I'm actually not interested from a political perspective about people's personal decisions about why they choose to get married or don't, right? Um, and so I think often those of us who have been kind of critiquing marriage equality get put in this box that like we're living somehow in some la-la land where we actually don't live in the social world, right? Or we're not responding to actual conditions and actual life uh, kind of um, practices that people are actually doing, right, um, one. And then two, that, um, you know, that, and that, that there isn't actually a kind of um, vision and some, and actually been written some very clear kinds of um, uh, documents saying what else, what next, what have you, right? So I want to kind of say that. Um, uh, I also want to say that, um, you know, one of the issues that I think that we um, kind of have to contend with is that it is, it is this question of the marriage as an institution that that is not just that marriage doesn't have um, the framework doesn't sort of have economic um, that there is no economic sort of argument around marriage equality. I think there actually is an economic <laughs> argument quite clearly around it, right? Um, and, and, and that the economic argument, that there's a, a, a disagreement about, um, politically about whether the sort of argument around marriage equality from the sort of economics of it, um, you know, has a certain kind of validity. Um, the other thing I'll say is that one of the things that I think that we need to be very um, kind of careful is, is, is how sort of the sort of push for same-sex marriage is not a natural, it's not, we, I want to remove this assumption that like somehow, oh, this is just the next mm -hmm. step in kind of LGBT, mm -hmm. the, the, oh, we went from Stonewall, right, and now <laughs> marriage <laughs> is what made logical sense. No, that that was actually a process mm -hmm. that was very much involved in um, a kind of response to, to AIDS and a kind of reaction, um, again, a, and a reaction to, to act up in some of the more kind of radical elements within queer organizing, and some political choices were made to drive us in this particular direction, that there are a hell of a lot of resources that have also backed up that decision, sure. right? So I want to kind of ground this in not just about a kind of broad sort of political just critique, 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 but it's actually some real clear, cogent ways in which this is operating, you know, kind of, um, you know, in, in, in the culture right now. Um, and the last thing I'll say on that, and then I'll, I'll kind of do my, my sort of prepare piece, is that, um, you know, one of the things, one of the ways in which I see this playing out um, currently is that I think clearly from a kind of um, lens around race and the kind of LGBT community is that, um, that I sort of see that the kind of marriage equality movement has actually furthered what were already very clear kinds of tensions around race and a certain kind of white supremacy that's very apparent in, um, you know, kind of in, you know, sort of gay life, if you will. But I think that one of the things that marriage has actually sort of done and the, the sort of push for that, and that's those sorts of, of um, sort of married relationships, we see this in, in the sort of gayborhoods, right? So the more that these sort of white gay sort of neighborhoods orient themselves around the kind of identities that like, you know, I'm a property owner, I'm a taxpayer, all of the things that are tied very much to these sort of notions of like white citizenship through which marriage also confers for white people, um, that that has then increased the ways in which that they have targeted um, and tried to just root black and Latino queer, particularly young people, from those spaces, right? Um, and that has been a, a kind of an ongoing project, whether we're talking about Chicago, yeah, Chicago. New York City, DC, San Francisco, I could go down the list, mm -hmm. right? So that's a, a, a kind of a, a problem um, to, that, that has real life consequences, right? Um, so, whatever we think about the mainstream equality <coughs> movement, it is almost finished with its agenda, and thank goodness, right? <laughs> Most of the policy issues that the mainstream LGBT movement has made central, the central focus 
um, have almost already been won. 2009, the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Act was passed. Um, in 2001, uh, don't, ask, don't, pay, uh, don't Ask, Don't Tell policy ended after 18 years, um, officially allowing for gays and lesbians to openly serve in the military. Um, and, you know, there is, uh, today, just before I got here, I heard the Supreme Court decided to take up Prop 8 and one of the other sort of marriage uh, equality related cases in this current sec session. Um, you know, and then there's the um, Employee uh, Non-Discrimination Act, right, which seems to somehow language and nobody talk about, right? But that's a, a whole other issue. Um, additionally, the federal government under the Obama administration has made several administrative policy, uh, administrative and policy changes that benefit LGBT people in the areas of Medicaid, hospital visitation rights, passport changes for transgender people, so on and so forth. All these things are being done, in my view, so that there are fewer and fewer barriers to future partner recognition at the federal level, much like, as many scholars have noted, Harry Truman's order to desegregate the armed forces had to be in place in order to sort of end the federal de jour discrimination. So I, I sort of see the things that the Obama administration has done is actually laying the sort of path for that, right? Um, so while there are many indications that the winds of change have shifted in order to favor legal recognition for LGBT people, these questions remain, right? What about the rest of us, right? And what do we do now? It is apparent that most of the state and national equality organizations are, are grappling with this very question. After marriage, then what? Um, but before the question of a more sort of radical way can be answered, we have to contend with some of the very alarming trends now occurring in the movement. So due to the global economic crisis, nonprofit organizations across the country are seeing a reduction in available funding from foundations, Long before this downturn, LGBT-focused funders had given very little support to grassroots you know, LGBT and trans organizations, um, or queer and trans organizations focused on racial and economic justice issues, and the downturn is only making foundation funding harder to come by. If organizations do not focus on very sort of corporate notions of like measurable goals and outcomes, they are often vulnerable to losing funding or not being funded at all, right? And as the former executive director of Queers for Economic Justice in New York City, I have sat with funders who have said, we don't care about you know, uh, qu queer adults in the shelter system. They'll give lip service around youth, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't care about that. We don't care about like, you know, queer women on welfare, right? Those are the conversations. I just recently moved to, to New Orleans, as some folks may know, right? Um, I've had some relationships there for a while. But organization, Women with a Vision, um, you know, which has queer leadership, right? Building was burned, office was burned, um, you know, and some by, right, by an arsonist, right? And, um, you know, none of the LGBT funders have stepped forward to offer Women with a Vision money towards getting a new building, <laughs> right? So this is, this is um, you know, more than um, a kind of, you know, uh, a kind of intellectual endeavor, but actually has material consequences for, like, LGBT work. Interestingly, I have seen grassroots organizations be described as not having capacity or impact or failing to meet the goals of certain kinds of grant deliverables, while the equality organizations have often failed to do the same, right? And yet, because of their ability to market and publicize their work, they tend to have long-established personal relationships with foundation officers and get away with multi-year grants in the hundreds of thousands. And so we think about the, the sort of question of, of actual funding. So think about this, right? So for you know, more sort of grassroots and people of color-led organizations, we're told, OK, well, you didn't meet all of these the sort of deliverables that you had um, you know, said that you were going to do, so no more funding, right? We can look at the, the sort of mainstream organizations, and if we consider um, until really very recently with the Obama administration, much of their attempts at sort of passing LGBT legislation, especially marriage equality, was a total failure. We ended up with 30 domas at the state level right through some of that advocacy or failures to, to be able to undermine those um, sort of pushes, right? But, but when you talk to the funders, they say, oh, we see a long-term strategy in place. They don't see a long-term strategy if we're talking about queer youth homelessness, right? Like, then, it's a, then you get money one year and it's done. Right, real life consequences. Right, not a not a heady, overly intellectual conversation. Um, so um, I'll move, and I know we, we we are short on time, so I'm gonna try to try to wrap this up real quick. Um, so marriage equality is also further exposing the political orientation of many LGBT funders and organizations. <coughs> 
New York State passed um, same-sex marriage in June 2001 and largely won by a, w and was largely won because of wealthy hedge fund managers and Tea Party sympathizers who raised money for four Republican state legislators to um, provide votes to ensure its passage. I wrote this piece for Alternate.com, which I'll just tell you the truth. I think it's like my best piece, and nobody fucking read it. You know, like, I, I, you know, I laid out the strategy. You know, fucking, you know. I, but let me write about Beyonce, and then I'm, you know, it's like whatever. It's so frustrating. <laughs> But anyway, in the alternate piece, I argue that, you know, many of the gay donors who raise money, even for LGBT equality organizations, are progressive only because of marriage and actually don't support most of what the rest of us would call a, any kind of progressive agenda. Single payer health care system, collective bargaining, public education, and into mass imprisonment, re reproductive justice, and the rest, right? So they're only sort of like, you know, Democrats, right? Only because of like the opposition to marriage equality. To prove my point, the Albany Times Union reported in September 2011, the New York City uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg hosted a fundraiser for these Republican lawmakers held on October 13, 2011. The event's um, hosting committee included Tim Gill of the Gill Foundation, an LGBT funder, Paul E. Singer, chairman of the conservative Manhattan Institute, and a host of other organizations, including representatives from Marriage Equality in New York, the Gill Action Fund, and Human Rights Campaign. This represents a potential crisis in future funding for more progressive LGBT organizations or organizations that are people, you know, people of color, LGBT organizations in general. But more importantly, it represents a definite political move to the right by the LGBT equality movement, as well as a new alliance formed of LGBT organizations, Republican lawmakers, right-wing think tanks, and donors. All of this leads me to conclude that the incorporation of LGBT equality into a conservative political framework can only mean that we will continue to see LGBT rights, both domestically and internationally, being used as a way to make racial justice a foregone conclusion. <laughs> Radical Jewish lesbian writer Sarah Shulman has named the ways this is playing out in Israel and its relationship to Palestinians, right, in her argument around pinkwashing. Mm. As long as Western liberal democracies can name so-called gay rights as the new litmus test for an appropriate 21st century democracy, we can obsess about anti-gay legislation in Nigeria and say nothing about the violence and economic exploitation of the Shell Oil Company on the land and bodies of Nigerians. We can be seduced by the international gay travel industry to visit gay-friendly and post-racial paradises like Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and say nothing of the massive police violence and genocidal remorse removal of blacks from favelas in preparation for the 2014 World Cup and 2016 Summer Olympics, which is happening right now. It is a wonder that many people outside of the United States, particularly those, is it any wonder uh, that people outside the United States, particularly those in Sub-Saharan Africa, have grown resentful of increasing threats to pull critical funding by NGOs and Western nations for not being LGBT friendly enough, um, while we led all sorts of violence and exploitation, <laughs> by, often by corporations, evangelical churches that originate in the West, go unmentioned. A Kenyan political cartoon published in the Kenya Star in November 2011 shows a white man standing behind an African man whose pants are pulled down to the ankles demanding, bend if you want the money. The white man is also holding a newspaper with the headline, UK attaches funding to gay rights. So this is the, like, the actual sort of political world, right? Like this is this is where we we sort of are, right? Um, in this sort of um, you know sort of push for equality, through which marriage equality is kind of the primary um, you know sort of uh, driver. Um, I guess I'll just you know kind of close by saying that um, you know I think that there are like real um, you know sort of things that people are doing so because I have particular kinds of critiques of marriage equality doesn't mean I'm not doing other kinds of work or that I'm not doing sort of other writing or sort of organizing or policy work that doesn't have real like life implications in other ways right because I don't see a vision in marriage equality right like that's that's those to me we just like disavow ourselves of that like false like dichotomy right um, 
you know, I was one of the authors of a, a document called Beyond Marriage, right, which people here may have read or whatever, which very clearly lays out some very clear ways to, to sort of move some of these things forward. And we can discuss some of those in, in the Q&A. But I will, will stop um, at that point um, and, and turn it over. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so now we're going to move to a structured discussion part of the evening. Um, we do have some questions that were emailed to us as well, some that have already been collected. If you have any more, go ahead and move them to the end, and um, Billy will help collect them. Um, we are going to start with this first one that we did receive in, the, in an email. This is an abbreviated question sent from Melissa, um, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name, Mara Turano. Nonprofits like Human Rights Campaign hailed the victories for gay marriage, i.e., gay assimilation, but has said and did nothing about Proposition 35 in California, a poorly written referendum which radically criminalizes sex work and sex workers, many of whom are queer and trans women of color, and ultimately leads to fur further queer marginalization. There has always been this tension historically. The need for certain queers to assimilate leads to the further marginalization of more radical queers. We see this most clearly with the history of the Stonewall Inn riot and almost complete, uh, with the almost complete erasure of the role of Sylvia Riviera and other trans women of color um, who were sex workers from that history by more privileged assimilationist mm -hmm. queers. Can anyone on the panel comment further on this tension while possibly more, more um, widening the discussion to differences between queer assimilation and queer liberation? And I think that's an excellent question, yeah. so you're there. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like your territory. You well, can. I'll say this. I, I'll, I, so in the question, I also just want to, um, because I feel like this is where some of the tensions come is that people, so this becomes this sort of definition of, of radical, right? Because I don't think that like, so some of what the equality stuff is doing is happening to people who aren't necessarily see themselves as radical, but it's sort of on the backs of like, you know, poor and working class, mostly black and brown queer folks, right? So it's not, so I don't want to set up where it's, where it's like the radicals versus like somebody else, right? Whether, despite how I self-define, right? That's not the, the point. But, but um, where I see, um, I'll give you an example, right? Of like how this like clearly has, has played out. And, and maybe, and so maybe it's like part of the tension. So it's like, I think people, again, they think that like we just are just kind of making this stuff up. But like if I, the, the shit that I've, I'm looking at Terry Bogus and all the shit that we've heard over the years in different meetings, you would just not even believe. One of which was about two years ago, um, the Centers for Disease Control was about to release some new data, which they did, showing that you know gay men in the U.S. were still 50 times more likely to contract HIV than anybody else in society. Um, there was a phone call of some of the um, you know HIV/AIDS national organizations and some of the LGBT ones, equality ones. Some of the equality organizations were pushing the the kind of AIDS movement, right? Um, to not actually do a whole lot with that information, to not actually like do any press releases or to try to draw any attention to it, because as long as we still talk about AIDS as a particular kind of condition that impacts like you know queer and trans folks, that it actually goes against the the sort of messaging that they have been pushing around marriage equality. Because if people continue to associate gay with AIDS, it doesn't fit the the frame and the message and the sort of visual that they've pushed to to sort of draw people. People to marriage, like that's the, like so that's the shit that's going on. So so that that's 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 so it, to me it's like I'm not even it's not even a question of like like there is so obviously these, the tensions around like sort of assimilation or sort of like more liberatory sort of projects. But like but just to give you an example, like that's just actually just some like straight up like real everyday like gutter shit as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> you know of, of how the shit rolls, right? So. Um, and, and so that, like, that is, I, so I want to like also ground this into like some real life, like, like this is the stuff that's happening from the sort of like just the people who are actually pushing this, the sort of movement stuff. Like this is the stuff that's happening. And, and, and I mean, I guess what I want to say is also, and there's nothing, there is nothing new unique. and or unique about yeah. that, right? So that right. is, yeah. so that's that is the same story that we could tell about the mid-century civil <laughs> rights movement, which frames itself up around a politics of respectability that shuts out loud women and Bayard Rustin and 
and anyone who self-identifies as communist or I mean like or pacifist right that, that you know the that tension around respectability politics as a central strategic move of um, of of a movement m meant to understand itself on the basis of equality I mean and, and, and then it, so, so I, I guess what I'd say is that on the one hand it's not new and so it's lack of newness makes me kind of shrug my shoulders about it, right? But then the reality is of course that at every point there's real embodied real people. people and lives that are impacted by it. But I, but I also f am um, sympathetic to Diva's question around how we manage, um, how we manage those wins with little w's that are part of moving agendas towards something at the same time that they are limited by all of the stuff that they're limited by, right? So Rosa Parks becomes the Montgomery bus boycott vision because she fits and doesn't actually fit, but can right. be described in a way that allows her to fit. In. And so, but then our historical memory gets all screwed up and we end up with the help. Right. right. Okay. <laughs> right. And, right. And we en we end up with like you know, black women as domestic workers need some white girl from college to get to tell them their stories and like poop pies and just what? Right. And so you end up with this whole like Confederate reimagination of what, of what those experiences were. So right. so I'm I'm not I don't like so and both are true at the same time right yes. there are both all of these choices being made that shed all of the so-called disreputable elements of any set of movements in order to make these much more narrow citizenship claims around marriage around um, uh, service in the military around which sorts of bodies are allowed to have citizenship rights mm -hmm. and then at, and at the same and that has material consequences and yet at the same time we recognize the sort of political constraints in which people are operating like yeah, yeah yes i mean i'm not quite sure what to say <laughs> other than mm -hmm. and and to you know i mean not to be too self-congratulatory about having organized you know and this these kinds of spaces but to keep these spaces going where these conversations are happening so that um, and to keep, um, you know, while, you know, to make sure that the folks who are at those meetings hearing this happening um, and, and experiencing privilege in whatever ways that, you know, based on their identity, their intersectionality they may have or not have, um, are, are also moving that conversation forward too. But the, money, the resource mm -hmm. piece mm -hmm. is the part, like beyond the conversations mm -hmm. question, it's, yes. it's, it's, you know, it's that Mitchell Gold oh. isn't going to yeah. write a check to women with a vision, right? Now, there's, I mean, there's a lot going on with what's happening. Right. right. Um, but, it's, but it's not only that queer communities in New Orleans don't write the check, it's also true that none of those civil rights organizations did, oh, yeah, right? Absolutely. So, so, so at, at the, the, mar the, the being pushed to the margins is happening in, in all of that. Right. Nor is an NOPD at all interested in who did it. Right. All right, I think we're going to move on to our next question. And um, keep in mind, we had several really great ones, so we will only get to a couple of them, but perhaps we can somehow create an online dialogue afterward. Actually, an we'll talk about it an event. Segue later. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, next question. Um, in light of the increasing public opinion, public opinion support for same-sex marriage, do you think that legalization will close off these outlets to talk about all these other forms of family family being marginalized? If so, how do we shift this conversation? And I would um, actually really love to hear Liz's opinion on that. I, I think it resonates a lot with um, some of the, the personal conflict you have. Um, gee. <laughs> um, what's the question? How are we going to do it? Or what do I hope to Here. see? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Both. <laughs> well, Obviously, I chose to get married just yesterday, and I married one person who I don't live with and I see twice a month. Mm -hmm. And I'm very struck by how everybody takes that so seriously, and no one's even asked, are you planning to live together? But the other relationships that both Scout and I have with the people who really help us through our daily lives, I mean, he's of great support to me, you know, that we, you know, text and email and phone multiple times a day. But I am really concerned about other kinds of relationships, the ones that really help us through our daily life, like my friend Jackie, as I was saying, that there is no way to honor that. 
And for me, it's so much about health insurance because I'm self-employed and like profoundly underinsured. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always thinking about health insurance and Jackie, who works for NYU, her sister's unemployed and she can't even put her sister on her health insurance plan. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously the health insurance problem is huge, but as things stand now, it's entwined with that and that only certain kinds of relationships get your health insurance. And I think we have to work on this from multiple angles, including the health insurance one. Um, I just want to say that I think, uh, you know, I think that's exactly the kinds of conversations that um, we need to be having and not just conversations. Because here's the thing is that I think, I think that a lot of people understand that, right? Um, regardless of what their position on marriage or marriage equality is, a lot of people, particularly in this economy, right, understand that, you know, this kin of mine, right, this person who's kin to me, I cannot help. Right? This, you know, I can't do this. And, and that is something that can be a political conversation, that can be a persuasive conversation. But I'm not, but I feel like, um, I feel like we don't communicate it that well um, on the left. Um, and, and I don't mean, I, I feel like, I feel like what we communicate is how, how angry we are um, um, and how hurt about injustice, um, which we have a right to be, and that anger and hurt can be productive. But, um, but I think that there's so much commonality, so much common experience in terms of um, so many of the issues that we care about uh, that we don't do a good job of articulating and not just articulating, doing movement work around, right? Um, and I, that's, what, that's what I'm talking about, I guess, when I, you know. That's just really what I'm investing in. I, I, I just want to respond. The, the, the thing that will happen after um, marriage equality is same-sex divorce. And that, and, and, and so, the, and then that, <laughs> right, 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 right. And so, that, and so then that will be the thing where all of this really plays out, right? Because um, you don't really know what marriage is until you're dissolving it. Um, and it, because, because you, the, the fact is, the health insurance question is ridiculous because it ought not be relational, right? Right. Human beings should have health insurance. Actually, they should just have health care. Mm -hmm. you know, done, right? And so, like, fuck your friend. You should just have, your friends just have health care because she exists, right? And right. not because she's your friend and, you know, because all, and, you know, this is your point about, like, if, if, if your life chances are associated with your, relate, you know, whether or not you're in good relational circumstances, right. then poor people are screwed, period. Mm -hmm. they, got, they got lots of relatives who would do all kinds of things for them that just can't because they didn't got nothing. Right, so 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 that one I think we address from like human beings should carry the capacity for healthcare, yes. but the but the issue of like what is marriage going to mean will get will get worked out in divorce court because that's where you find out what marriage is and you find out what bodies are valued. So you figure out whether or not um, the the um, same sex marriage has altered our conception of parenting when a court has to decide which is the natural, normal parent with whom the child is going to reside. Um, you know, having been divorced in Illinois where there is this bizarre fatherhood rights movement, which is not really about, it's just, just the most bizarre thing ever. And the impact that that had on my capacity to make all sorts of life choices because apparently if a heterosexual black male shows up in court with an interest in seeing um, the child that was produced from his marriage, then the courts will bend over backwards, jump up and down, do a little dance with thrills <coughs> and excitement. It doesn't matter what else is happening in all of the circumstances. If, if heterosexual black man wants to lay eyes on child that heterosexual black man created genetically, that is the precedent relationship, period. Because apparently no one expects that to occur in the world. Right. And so because they don't expect that to occur, occur in the world, everything else will be thrown out, right? And so you find out what the courts think about two women being married to one another, who's the wife, when the court will make a decision about who's going to get supported and who's going to get children and who's going to get the house. and who, Because that, that's when you figure it out in a way that you don't in all the intricacies of... Of, of you know, people can make all kinds of things within marriage, but it's when the unmaking of it, when the state gets to decide what you really are to one another. Are there any more comments on that one? Okay. Um, and I think this will probably be our last one, and it'll be fairly brief. Um, but I 
noted it, especially in, in Diva, your conversation, and I think it's important as we try to um, navigate these waters of bringing this academic into the community and into the real world that we kind of heard Kenyon discuss, like, okay, this is the real political world. So what's an effective way to explain to my non-academic family that gay marriage is not the end-all, be-all of LGBT issues? And I think it's simplistic but important. <laughs> I missed the question. Oh, sure. Oh, we sorry. Again. You look scared. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, okay. We're having a little. Okay. Yeah, it is the real world. I don't. I, <laughs> one more. One I more. Grocery time. shop, damn it. Yeah, one sorry. more. Time. Sorry. <laughs> what is an effective way to explain to my non academic family that gay marriage is not the end all be all of LGBT issues? Well, see, that's exactly the project, right? <laughs> um, for me, it's talking about kinship, right? Um, because, uh, because, you know, even in sort of straight life, right? I mean, you, you've told this story, right? Like, in you know, straight life, marriage is not the end all be all of, of anybody's sort of kinship relations, right? Um, so this whole idea, right, that your friend cannot be honored as your partner, right? Um, or not your, you know what I mean? But, but as kin to you, right, is, is I think a very, very resonant idea, right? I don't think that that has to come um, you know, um, at the expense of marriage or be, uh, being against marriage, but just to say, like, marriage is a, a thing, right? It's one thing. It touches on this, I, this romance, right? This promise, this hopefulness, this mythology that we have, and that's not bad. I'm not against any of those, th those things. Like, I love all that stuff, right? Um, but there's also the reality that we walk through this world with all different kinds of people, and many of those people are not related to us by blood, right? Um, some of those people are not going to be the people that we choose to marry in the first instance, right? Um, and I think that when you talk about, you know, how the state has um, a responsibility to and an interest in, right, supporting all different kinds of kinship relations, people begin to sort of, you know, understand and get it. And I feel like that is the, you know, that is the that is the where I would love to see. Um, queer critiques of marriage sort of go. Um, and I know that that's, that's part of a queer critique of marriage, of course, but, um, but I think too much, and I, you know, some, my friend Yasmin would kill me, but I think too much time is, is spent being against marriage, right? Even though you have these real political, your consequences, right? That you are in meetings with funders who don't, you like, we don't care about that, or that's not respectable. You know, I think that in sort of our public discourse, um, in our discourse with people who are not inside these movements and inside these fights, I think it's really important to, to not, um, you know, it's not about being against marriage. It's about recognizing the, and supporting the ways that real people live their lives. Yeah. There too, if I could, I'm sorry. Um, so one, I, my mother who has a high school education reads everything I write, right? <laughs> Friends of hers who are in their 70s who live in South Carolina where she does read everything I write, right? So, and, they, and we talk about it, right? So I don't assume a range of things about like people in community not capacity to not understand these things, right? So that's number one. Number two, how I talk about it is this, like look, I believe, I mean, if you want to get to like real, like my communication, sort of media strategy hack, I believe in a separation between church and state. I believe that if you want to get up in a Vera Wang on any given Sunday in June That's in right. a church or whatever, do you, boo, <laughs> right? <laughs> do you. Um, however, that should be a ceremony or party, whatever you want to do, like a bar mitzvah, right? When you go, any two people who go to the DMV or to whatever kind of state licensing, that language should be neutral. It's civil, you know, reci reciprocal beneficiary. If you want domestic partnership, whatever the language is, it should be de it should be uh, decoupled, haha, -ha, from you know marriage as a so that whatever marriage means and people who are the oh, but it's sacred, fine, boo. I don't care. Do what you you know. It's, if, if that's how you roll, that's how you roll. I don't care, right? Like, but that but from a, a kind of um, civil sort of process, like the state should not look at that as because you got up in a beer wing on any given or you know, or had a sort of ceremony of that nature, that it should look at whatever that household arrangement is or that relate rela 
relationship as primary. So therefore, the, the actual certification or whatever should not even be a marriage license, right, if, if you ask me, and we should change that. And people should be able to go to the DMV and just fill it out the way you do. If I'm going to like, do something like give my organs or something like that that's you know that serious, I should just be able to check off, this is who my boo is when I register to vote. <laughs> and you know, in four years when I renew this sucker, we'll see how we are. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that's simple. And I talk to people like that, and they get it. Boom. I, you know, I, I, I'll, you know. Um, so I, I'm, Kenya, I'm so glad you, you said that point. I mean, for, yeah, about the notion of people's capacity. But I would say this: I do my shock and awe lectures with my students. So we live in the academy, which is the the professorial part. But your students aren't in the academy. They barely read, right? So, um, so, you know, so with my students, when I'm doing this, I just, I do my shock and awe lecture. I, the vast majority of my students, progressive little babies who sign up for a class with me, right, have no idea that in a majority of American states, people can be fired um, based on their um, sexual orientation and or gender self-presentation. Um, we, we, you know, I do the bathroom lecture, right? We, we just straight up do the transgender bathroom lecture. Like, what, what is the world when you can't go to the bathroom? And we do the the, you know, violence that people experience in the context of, you know, so I just, you know, this is, this is the tax that even the most respectable gay families, right? So take, take your, your, your upper income, white boys married to, look like Thomas Roberts and his husband, just like ridiculously beautiful and well, and here's the tax that they pay to live because they can only live in certain states, in certain neighborhoods, in certain communities, in certain, because despite, you know, even in all the ways that they do clearance, you know, when they show up in Hell's Kitchen, and mm -hmm. which is where I live when I'm here in New York, and so they take over communities, they throw all kinds of people out, they still, to live in Hell's Kitchen, which is mid town, they're paying this tax, right? So safe neighborhoods, even for the whitest, most respectable, wealthiest couples, still pay something that, you know, Joe and Jane don't have to pay when they go to buy their houses, right? And Negroes pay it too, right? So mm -hmm. we kind of—I just—I just do the shock and awe lecture yeah. from employment, mm -hmm. from um, uh, housing, from the you know my bathroom lecture, and I just kind of walk it through, and then I say, okay, how many of these does marriage solve, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, so so we walk through like here here here's what the agenda looks like. How many does marriage solve? And by the way, I do the same thing around the racial civil rights movement of the mid-century, where I say, here are the conditions of inequality. How many of these are solved by the lunch counter sit-ins? How many are solved by, and the answer is, some of them are, like some of the, like this one, <coughs> right? That check, right? And which ones aren't? The rest of these, right? And so, I mean, part of how we get to the, like, it's not the be all and end all, is to make clear what the other ones are. The brilliance of the HRC GLAD strategy has been, I think they have attached the economic arguments to the marriage arguments, in addition to the it's all about love arguments, right? So they, 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 they attach the romantic rom-com right. and the media strategy and the here are all the things that marriage solves. So people get, here's what marriage solves. Mm -hmm. But they don't, we haven't talked about what it does. all this, you know, that there's, it's not covered under Fair Housing Act, all of those kinds of things. Liz, do you wanna, fin Liz, do you wanna finish up really quick? Do you want to make a comment? I wanted to say something actually that went back to a previous question, oh, yeah, sure. if that's okay. Um, I was thinking about what you said, Melissa, about that you see what marriage is by how it ends. And I was mm -hmm. thinking actually about end of life issues. Mm -hmm. And um, my friend Jackie, who left, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, she stayed for me. <laughs> You're not allowed to leave anymore, remember? Yeah, that's the new rule. Yeah. Dear. Um, but um, as part of the cancer work, I do a lot of training of healthcare um, providers. And so we say that aside from whatever, however you want to change your forms, and obviously even in New York, if you check married, you could be married to someone of the same sex. That's not really what matters. The question is, who do you want in the room with you when you're going to get a difficult diagnosis or have to make a difficult treatment decision? And a friend of Jackie's and mine uh, for over 30 years as well, Jackie became best friends with her when they were in <coughs> second grade, just died of ovarian cancer. And it turns out that she, the woman who died, her name was Shirley, and her partner had actually married. They went to Massachusetts and got married. Again, quietly, no big deal. 
but who took care of Shirley when she was dying? Yes, her wife, um, but also the group of five friends who were with her every single day and did everything for her. And at the funeral, all we heard was, at, you know, it was so nice and liberal, you know, her wife, her wife, her wife. And the friends, it, we saw this, I'll just, I don't need to finish that sentence, you, you know what I'm gonna say. And it's the same thing that we saw, especially in the early years of the AIDS epidemic. Who is really there? It's not just who are your kin, but who are your people? Who is there for you? And you, you see what that is, I think, going on what you said, Melissa, you see it more at the end. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have to leave it there, unfortunately. Um, this has been super awesome. Let's give a hand to our panelists and moderator. <clears throat> so, if, if you're like me and feel like we've just kind of scratched the surface, we have something for you. There is a follow-up discussion happening on Tuesday, December the 11th um, at 85th Avenue, room 802, uh, from noon to 2 p.m. It'd be great just to get some folks back together in a smaller room, and um, we can carry out this same kind of roundtable discussion ourselves and try to figure out where do we go from here? What, what are the next steps? So everyone should have gotten one of these little flyers. Please come join us for that. What's that, Sydney? It's a brown bag lunch, so bring something delicious in a brown bag. If you're interested in social justice-related things going on here at the New School, Sydney, can you just wave to folks? Um, there's lots of good work going on here um, related to all of these different kind of aspects of identity and um, how they're born out in our institutions. So talk to Sydney. She will um, fire you up organize you, rally you, and you can do some cool stuff here at the New School. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This has been an amazing night, and we'll see you some other time. And thank you again to Billy and Jessica. You guys did. Organizers extraordinaire.